Load balancing is a fun one for me because in my opinion, it's actually a pretty easy win. But in AWS, load balancing comes in three different options, three different shapes and sizes. We have the network load balancer here. We'll choose a different color here. We have the application load balancer here. And then using maybe pink here, I'll say we have the gateway load balancer. So let's talk about what these three options are and when you may use them. Network load balancer is the traditional load balancer. It's what we all grew up learning, you know, as network engineers, when you first learn the raw concepts of load balancing, you learn the raw concepts of network load balancing. It operates on layers three and four, specifically layers three and four. In a traditional architecture, we're thinking about infrastructure as a service or virtualization or even physical servers here where our workloads are deployed like so. There will be four identical workloads in this hypothetical example. And rather than have traffic, you know, come in right here, all the production traffic comes in on this server and we wait for it to die. And then we just somehow or other roll the traffic over to the next server and wait for it to die. No, that's not good. That's why we have all these other servers sitting here, isn't it? No, instead we want to distribute the traffic across these four servers to balance out how it works. And this is what the network load balancer did you know, and still does for the most part for the longest time. The network load balancer listens on some sort of port that you define. Now, the interesting thing about network load balancer, you traditionally see it used with web load balancing the most, but it doesn't have to be. It can operate on anything layer three or layer four. You might be actually load balancing something like port 22 which we know is SSH, but also SFTP. Perhaps we have a bunch of SFTP servers set up and we're expecting a large influx of data transmissions uh, to come in. Now, that's not the most ideal scenario because, you know, with data transfers, we're kind of getting into session specific details, but it's more like just a hypothetical scenario to highlight for you that network load balancers don't really care about the application at all. They don't care if it's actually web traffic or API traffic or file transfer traffic. They don't care. They just know that they're supposed to listen on some port. And as traffic arrives on that port, we load balance it across the backend target servers. Now it is possible to set up things like, hey, let's have our network load balancer listen on port 80. And if traffic arrives on port 80, maybe we only load balance that traffic to servers one and two. And if traffic arrives on port 8080, let's load balance it to a different set of backend servers. You can absolutely configure it to do stuff like that. It's basically like traditional port forwarding, but giving it a round robin load balancing preference. These backend servers, we're gonna call target groups. That's an important nomenclature in AWS's load balancing terminology. So in a network load balancer, we can listen on one port and set up one target group and a different port and set up a different target group to forward traffic into. Now here's an interesting concept. Sometimes this traffic is coming in from the public, meaning it's basically unsolicited traffic. It just comes into us from the public. So we put a load balancer out here that is public facing to accept this traffic and load balance it in. Again, that's most commonly seen with web traffic, but it's also very common for web servers to have to communicate to backend resources like databases. And lots of times the way this works is we actually send API requests to middleware servers who then can, can, can actually process the request, make some logical changes if need be, before it queries or writes data to a backend database. As you can see here, we have another opportunity for load balancing our middleware servers. This is another very common thing to do. In this case, we set up what's known as a private load balancer. And it, does, it works the exact same way. 
It'll listen on some sort of port, maybe 443, and load balance across the backend target group, who will then carry out whatever requests it's supposed to do. The big thing about the network load balancer is that it only operates on layer three and layer four. The actual payload of data itself, the actual application that is being communicated to, does not matter. And it doesn't, it does not matter. And this stands in obvious stark contrast to the application load balancer. Now the application load balancer, in my opinion, should actually be renamed. I think it should be named a web load balancer because you almost exclusively see this working with web traffic. And when I say web traffic, I really just mean anything that's operating over HTTP or HTTPS. It doesn't necessarily have to be websites. It could absolutely be things like APIs or even gRPC. These things are still carried out over the HTTP protocol, but not necessarily serving websites, although it could be. Perhaps I do have web servers set up like so. What's cool about the application load balancer is it operates up to layer seven. And if you're not really uh, familiar with what that really means, when you type in a website, you go to HTTPS colon whack whack, you know, CBT nuggets dot com. This is your root website that you go to. So we're just going to call this root. This is the path that we're looking at right here. As traffic comes in to CBT nuggets dot com root, we can tell the application load balancer if traffic comes to the root website take them to this target group right here. However, if traffic comes in to something like the profile endpoint where users are updating their profile or adjusting anything like that, we may take them to a separate target group right here. Where you actually see this the most widely used is when we start to target different media endpoints like images, or videos, or different handlers, like upload. Maybe we want users to upload uh, videos or something like that. In this case, in this scenario, from an architecture standpoint, we get to be a lot more flexible because the upload endpoint, it's gonna have a very different profile uh, to it, a very different style of architecture to it for handling ingesting data and writing data and updating a back-end catalog than, say, the front-end landing page. Do you see how if you were to take your application, your whole application, and break it apart into smaller pieces, pieces A, pieces B, and pieces C, things that users might be using a lot might be in piece B. Things that users might not be doing very much at all of might be in piece A. Things where users are querying data might be in piece C. So now we can custom tailor our entire workload to a separate environment from these pieces above. We could deploy very large instances for component B and very small instances for component A. And for component C, we might build instances that have a tight coupling to a database and therefore might have a different profile set up for it. The application load balancer is one of the ways that you start to transition from uh, pure monolithic infrastructure as a service to more like microservices without being true microservices. True microservices would be using things like Lambda or ECS in conjunction with SNS and SQS. And when you start moving into platform as a service offerings like I just offered, for the most part, all of this scaling and load balancing and networking is handled for you, which is a pretty big win. But if for any reason you are more or less stuck using virtual machines, and there are legitimate reasons to use virtual machines. In fact, remember, I mean, I, I flipped over to this console earlier and I had all that writing and I was like, hey, you know, I was working on my website. It's actually running on a container on a virtual machine 
rather than using things like ECS or Azure Container Instances because I have very specific port needs and how it handles like port forwarding traffic that only a virtual machine can handle for me. So do you see what I mean? Like while it's not my preference to work on infrastructure as a service, you can still do some really cool things with it when you need, you know, basically a sandbox environment. And in that case, load balancing your traffic across virtual machines in different ways starts to make a lot of sense. Now, the last one is gateway load balancer, and you're really not going to see a lot of this on AWS exams. What this is, is a way to load balance, this is important, third party, aka non-AWS appliances. Put another way, if you were bringing your own load balancer solution, or maybe, and more importantly, your own firewall solution, like hosted firewall appliances, the gateway load balancer can sit in front of these multiple virtual firewall appliances and load balance them potentially across different regions, which could be a pretty big win. In this case, your target groups that you're actually trying to load balance traffic to are going to be the approved partner third-party appliances. So it doesn't work with just anything. You'll have to do your own research and figure out if the virtual appliances that you want to use in your VPC are compatible or approved for the gateway load balancer. For the most part, the advanced networking exam is going to want you to focus in on these two with a bigger emphasis on the application load balancer because of the more uh, complex nature of it. The very, just very much deploying them can be very complex on its own. The last thing I'll say with regards to all of this, and I'm going to put this in kind of a teal color right here is both network load balancing and application load balancing are tightly coupled with compute scaling. Meaning when I have two virtual machines running and they become over encumbered, I need to add more virtual machines quickly into the mix. And when I add these new virtual machines into the mix, they need to be automatically picked up by the load balancer and having traffic distributed across it. It's usually not enough to just deploy the load balancer and say, whew, I'm done, I'm good. No, in fact, you're almost always going to be doing the load balancer deployment as part of a scaling operation, whether manually scaling out virtual machines yourself or setting up auto scaling. We're gonna talk a lot more about this as we progress through this set of videos. But for now, this has been understanding AWS's load balancing options. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.